What's up, guys? Welcome back to the final episode in the series that we are doing on the American Jezebel. And I want to open up with um, <clears throat> something hopefully a little lighthearted here. Uh, there was a young couple sitting to uh, sitting down to lunch with a uh, with a little more seasoned couple. This young couple they hadn't been married very long, just a few months, and they were trying to get some advice. And uh, you know they they never wanted to have a fight. They didn't want to argue. They never wanted to have any of these problems they'd heard so much about with people that had been married for a while. And they were asking the the older couple. What's what's the secret? You guys have been married a long time. We never see you guys fighting, arguing. Nobody ever, you know, has that we're aware of. Um, what we, what's your secret of a successful marriage over this, you know, such a long time? And the the husband spoke up and he said, "Listen, the key to our marriage, the key to any successful marriage, is very simple." He he took his wife's hand in his and she smiled. And he said, when we got married, when we decided to get married and, um, and we, we were fresh at it, he said, we decided that I, the man, would make all the major decisions for our household. And my wife would make all the minor decisions. And the young couple kind of kind of thought about that and pondered and and so that's the that's the secret. That's the and the older gentleman said, "Well, you know, the funny thing is we've actually never had any major decisions." Hey guys, and welcome to another exciting episode of Your Life, God's Word. Thanks for joining this time of relevant conversation and scriptural application where we apply God's Word to the most important areas of life, God, family, and community. We pray this broadcast inspires, encourages, challenges, and blesses you in every way. So without further ado, let's dive right in to this week's episode. All right, so hopefully you had a couple of uh, seconds there to think about that. Not sure how something like that really, really flows over the podcast. Uh, it's always kind of funny when you when you do that in a, like a live setting. But uh, I don't know. Maybe I got some chuckles or some smiles or maybe just blank stares. But you know, the, the main thing here is that Jezebel is. Jezebel as a character, as a as a person, as a as a as a an Old Testament figure, usurped God in His authority. The entire thing is about idolatry, right? Which is putting something else in the place of God, and part of that is to tear down and attack and destroy. God's divine order, okay? God's divine order is, is clear when we, when we read through Genesis, we do study there, but it is actually, it's actually spelled out for us in the New Testament as well, you know, in case people are looking at the Old Testament, that mean old, vile, wicked Old Testament, we don't, we're, we're the New Testament church. Well, in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul clearly elucidates the topic of the entire chapter. Well, at least the first half of the chapter, right? He, he, he gives what the topic is, right? He says, be followers of me even as I also am of Christ. Now, I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Now, that, that rubs against our, um, our Western sensitivities, especially if, we, if, if, if we've had any exposure to the things that we've already talked about, right? The, the heavy 
feminism, the heavy um, kind of anti-nuclear family uh, rhetoric that comes out, and uh, it, it can rub us the wrong way. But but the the divine order is God, Christ, man, woman. Not not every man over every woman. I, we don't have time to get into this because it's not the the entire point of the study, but uh, go study it for yourself. God, Christ, man, woman. When we get into the family, that is the divine order of responsibility, accountability, and authority. And when we take that divine order and we flip-flop it around and this kind of thing, that's when we end up with problems, with issues. Why? Because God is the one who established that. It's not man-created. If it was just man-made, then if you flop it around, if you change it up a little bit, okay, no big deal. But because this is the way God ordered things, when we get it out of order, it causes problems. Now, before we get into this study today, I want to I want to put I want to put the entire story of Jezebel into a little bit of a modern a modern light, okay? Because we see like the Old Testament and it's clear like oh, she's the bad person. Uh, Ahab is is also wicked and evil and then you have the you know the, the good guys on Yahweh's side. But let's put this in a modern light to see how this could come about today. Can you see Jezebel? Right? She she's there. She's she's actually a victim. She's actually a victim. A young woman, right, treated like a pawn by her patriarchal patriarchal or is it patriarchal? Anyway, her her the patriarchy. Her father uh Ethbaal, this 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 guy just 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 because of po- uh, political alliance and expediency, she's whisked away to a foreign land, right? Stuck in a loveless marriage, away from her friends and her family and everything she knows and loves. She's nothing but a, a, a bargaining chip uh, so that her father and Ahab can have this political alliance and bring these two nations together. But who cares about her feelings? Who cares about her as a person? Um. You know, she's just used to kind of seal the deal between Samaria and Phoenicia, right? Tyre and Sidon, that area. Uh, she just wants to to hold on to a little small token of her previous life. And so she goes to Ahab and says, look, won't you grant me this, you know, the, the ability to worship Baal the way that the way that I want to worship. I'm not, you know, I, I'm here, I'm alone, I'm in a foreign land, and can you please just just give me grant me this one thing? In fact, uh, in fact, aren't you a people of toleration? It, didn't didn't Solomon, one of one of the great kings of the past, didn't he actually show how tolerant he was by by allowing his wives to to worship their gods and the way that the way that they wanted to. And so she she makes this plea, this poor girl, and, and Ahab, you know, he just, he allows her, you know, this, this small token of her homeland, and she can worship Baal how she wants to. And then she works, you know, she, Jezebel just works in her community. She organizes the community and uh, develops these, these activist groups that are centered around inclusion and tolerance because that's really what it's about. They're in the minority here, and and, and they they just want people to be inclusive and, and tolerant and, and and accept people that that maybe worship God in a in a different way, different methods of worshiping. Maybe even the same God. We don't you know we don't really want to judge these things. This is the God they know. His name just happens to be Baal, but look, he's using similar terms as the, as the God Yahweh, right? He, he is the, the God that, that is the God of gods, right? He, he, similar titles. He's, he's prince, right? He, he, he comes on the clouds. I mean, a lot of the similar language and things going on. So maybe it's just, it, we should just be tolerant, inclusive, and um, so then she, she continues to campaign, but as her power and her political and governmental power starts to build, now instead of just these little pockets of community organization and, and activism, now she starts to campaign and, 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 uh, and place judges in the land that, 
uh, and prophets in the land that, that are along her lines of, of thinking and along her, her thought processes. And, and they, over the decades, begin to amass political power. And no longer is she really in the minority. She starts to actually develop a majority opinion. You know, it's all about tolerance and inclusion. And um, they start to, you know, develop laws and, and get things on the books that, that push some of these policies into the public, in, into the public sphere. Over time, she, she starts to she starts to she she teaches and, and and preaches tolerance and inclusion, but starts to discredit the opposition by attacking them and 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 calling them intolerant. These these people of Yahweh, they're actually not just they're actually intolerant. We we should probably try to silence them actually, because we're about inclusion. We're about we're about tolerance. We're about love. We 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 don't want we and, and of course. We can't love those who disagree with us, and we can't be tolerant of those who differ from us. They're intolerant. We, we can't include in our inclusion. We have to exclude people in being inclusive. We can't include those who don't see it our way. And of course, now we've got the political power. We've got judges to ram this down their throats. We've got the prophets in, in place to prophesy what we want them to. We've got priests and we've got, we've got people at all these different societal institutions. We've got people, you know, that are, that are, that are there to, to support what we believe. And, and, and eventually this happens and, and God actually judges her wicked ways, and sends a, na a national famine across the land. A famine across the land. And it's because of the wickedness, the evil, the vile um, worship, the idolatry, turning away from Yahweh. And, and, and what does Jezebel do? Does she fall down and repent? No. In fact, Jezebel goes on another campaign and, and, and says that this is, this is judgment not because of her and, and the idolatry and, and Baal, no, 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 this is judgment uh, because of the intolerance and the hate perpetrated by the devotees of, of Yahweh. And see, this is what we get when we try to be tolerant. And, and so now she becomes even, even less tolerant, right? In her tolerance, she becomes more intolerant. And now there's laws pushed. Uh, it's now hate speech, to, to talk against Baal and, and, and promote Yahweh. That, when you love Yahweh, that's actually, you're hating the people of, of Baal. And that's, that's hate speech. And that's, that's, even though you may not be violent, that's violent speech. It's violent speak. Just your words are violent because you're serving a violent God, Yahweh. And so and now it's illegal to even speak of him or talk, him, talk about him or, 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 or to promote him. And so the priests of Yahweh have to go hide in caves. The prophets of Yahweh are now having to be, be rationed food and, and hide for their lives, punishable by imprisonment and death. This is the story of Jezebel. And let me just say this from the scriptures. What I've done here is to put a modern light, a modern spin on how this can happen. But 1 Kings chapter 18 is interesting. 1 Kings 18, 16 through 19 says, So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? And then, see, Elijah says, I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. But... You and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and followed the Baals. Notice what I said. Really, that is what happened. <laughs> the, the famine hit the land because of the evil Ahab and Jezebel were perpetrating, but they had, they had actually possibly even convinced themselves that, no, it was actually the fault of Elijah and the people of Yahweh. This entire scenario is exactly what we see in our world today. The Bible talks about this. That the Bible warns of this, and sometimes, sometimes we um, we might think, "Oh, that you know, that that's just good. That's just good rhetoric." But it, it's not. It's not just rhetoric. Okay, um, the Bible says to beware. You know, of those that 
call evil good and, and good evil. In Isaiah chapter 5, actually, in verse 20, it says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light, light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine and champions at mixing drinks, who acquit, who acquit the guilty for a bribe, but deny justice to the innocent. You see, the thing is, this is exactly what's happening in America today. Evil is being called good, and good is being called evil. Darkness for light, light for darkness, bitter for sweet, sweet for bitter. And how is this happening? Because there are people who are wise in their own eyes. They are enlightened. They are the enlightened ones. We're smarter. We're more scientific. We're, we're, we're somehow better than all these, these barbarous people around. This is how that can happen. And in our society, it absolutely has happened, folks. And, and we need to realize, as I said in the, very lengthily <laughs> in the last podcast, two hours, in fact, um, our institutions in our society have been completely overrun with evil. And the church needs to stop backing away from calling out evil. We need to have a message of this is truth, this is right, this is good. It's time to repent. However, understand uh, understand a principle from the Word of God that I think is very well captured in a, a quote by, it's attributed to Joseph Parker, and let me, just, let me just say the quote here. It says, The man whose little sermon is repent sets himself against his age and will for the time being be battered mercil- mercilessly by the age whose moral tone he challenges. There is but one end for such a man, off with his head. You had better not try to preach repentance until you have pledged your head to heaven. And I'm going to say, this is exactly the state that we are in. When, when people get, get out and actually stand for good, if, if people get out and actually call evil, evil, their head is on the chopping block. Maybe not at this point, literally, certainly on a social level, certainly people will defame, destroy, if they can, your reputation. Um, they'll dig into your past. You know, this ha- oh, look what you did 27 years ago, you know, and the guy's 35, right? <laughs> like, um, but this is, this is exactly what will happen. And let me just say this. The forces in our society today, if they could get away with it, they would absolutely haul people into public squares and chop their heads off. Uh, if they could get away with it, you know, that is a little too vile right now against people's sensitivities. But people, oh, the end times, the end times are tomorrow. OK, well, first of all, we're living in the end times, right? Acts chapter two, he says these prophecies about the last days. And then he says we're in the last days right now. Uh, so it's, the last days have been now for 2000 years. But when we, people talk about all oh, the persecution that could come and all the, the great tribulation and all this stuff, literally that can happen overnight. Overnight, it could happen. Look how quickly some of this stuff happened with COVID and our, our, our liberties completely evaporated. Tyrannical governors and uh, even people on the local level, tyrannical, okay? And we talked about it last time, so I'm not going to rehash everything, but I am going to say, right, like Governor Newsom, you can't even have a Bible study in your own in your own stinking home, but it's totally okay to be rioting in the streets. And and, and where is the outcry? Where are the, the, the forces of good marching in the streets saying, we will not have this? They're cowering with masks in their homes, okay? So this is exactly uh, what would happen. Now, Derek Prince said this. Where rich, where witchcraft prevails, the man is a spiritual dropout. 
I'm going to say that is completely true. When the spirit of Jezebel prevails, it's because the role that God has called the man to has been abolished. That doesn't mean the man is dead. That doesn't mean that the, maybe the husband has left the home. He might be present. He might even be like Ahab, right? A successful warrior, a, a king. He is successful, but in the home, it's upside down. That is what Jezebel fears. The thing that Jezebel really fears is God's divine order brought back to where it's supposed to be. And this is why all of these groups that you hear raving out there today, railing against the system and all that, all of them, 100%, they encompass and incorporate a high degree of quote-unquote Feminism. Now, I'll say feminism. If you're talking, do I want my wife to be feminine? Absolutely. I love my wife. She's awesome. I'm glad for her input, her intuition. I'm a smart guy, okay? <laughs> I grew up in the, the school of hard knocks and had to learn this the right, the, 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 the correct way. But get your wife's input, dude. Okay, don't just walk around thinking, oh, I've got oh, a pants in this family. Oh! That is not the way. Um, but at the end of the day, the man is the one with the final responsibility, accountability to God, and therefore authority given by God. Jezebel took out the prophets, the priests, the people who were of Yahweh, right? Those in those, those positions of authority, and she was totally fine with prophets and stuff, but only if they were, right? going to be prophesying and saying the things that she wanted. So, again, she, in today's world, uh, the, the spirit of Jezebel is not completely anti-church, as long as whatever church that is is not going to deal with Jezebel, not going to command repentance, not going to identify these kinds of things, but just have their little, you know, little worship service over here with their little TED talk afterward, you know, not, not to exceed 25 minutes, of course, because we got to get you out of here. She doesn't care about that, but a true prophetic voice, the true apostolic voice of the church, the, 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 the leadership that flows from God, Christ, man, woman, oh, Jezebel will rise up against that, you better believe it, and come after your head. This, this is an absolute, it's a truism. Okay, you, if you know the Bible, you understand the Bible. It is absolutely just like a like a duh aha moment. And if you and if you haven't gotten that moment yet, you go check what I'm saying in the scriptures. You're probably, especially if you're filled with the Spirit, you're getting a witness in your spirit right now, like an aha. Oh my goodness, I'm seeing this now. What was it that eventually took out? Jezebel. What was it? I would say it's the combination of Elisha and Jehu, right? Because remember, Elijah, he had the victory at Mount Carmel. Or maybe it's Carmel, if you, but I'll say Carmel, uh, right? But it was 20 years later that Jezebel was finally defeated and taken out. Because Elijah, victory at Carmel, when, when he had got word back from Jezebel, I'm going to kill you like you killed my prophets. He ran from her. For whatever reason, okay, he was not the guy to, to enact final victory. He, he had victory at Carmel, and, and, but, but he was not the guy. Now, maybe he was called to do so, but he backed off because of fear. I don't know. The Scripture doesn't clearly uh, uh, kind of let us know the behind the scenes there. But when he turned and ran, okay, I, I would say scripturally you can see that was kind of a kind of a start of a of a decline of his ministry and, and, and kind of a start of a pointing toward the next, which was Elisha. And then of course Elisha comes and and in the power of Elijah got his mantle, all of that, and what does he do? He anoints Jehu. Jehu goes out and immediately, boom, he starts wreaking havoc on the on the kingdom of Jezebel, right? Goes out, kills Joram and and uh, his contemporary, 
right? Two kings, boom, done for, just like that. And then what does he do? He goes and he takes out Jezebel. He goes and he takes out the prophets of Baal. Why couldn't Elijah have done that? I think maybe he could have if he was called to do so. We, we need to understand this is a matter of God's call and God's governmental authority. So what I'm talking about here, God, Christ, man, woman, it is God's authority and government. God's government. The answer to Jezebel is not just somebody who prophesies, because there were prophets in the day of Jezebel. We know of at least a hundred of them, right? In two caves that Obadiah protected, 50 and 50. And of course, Elijah was a mighty, powerful, prophetic voice. But it is governing the call and the anointing of God to govern. Jehu was anointed, not a prophet, a king. Kings rule. And I believe you can make the connection between kings in the Old Testament and apostles in the New Testament. Happy to discuss that with somebody, but that I believe you can make that connection. Kings rule, and that really is one of the functions of the apostles when you see the New Testament. You look at the book of Acts and these things. Uh, apostles, along with elders and deacons in the, in, the, in the local church, they were the governing authority of the church. And you end up with a king, Jehu, that is able just, I mean, in, in a short amount of time. Now, w- what happened? We're... Were, were there fewer troops on Jezebel's side now? W- was Jezebel just like getting old and, and, and languid and just to, no, we don't there's no indication of that. but he stepped into his calling, did not back away in fear when the intimidation come or the man, came or, or the manipulation came. He stepped forward in God, confident in his calling as the king, the rightful king and rightful ruler and God governor of God's kingdom, and he stepped into it, okay? I, uh, I I think a lot of times people don't understand. It's kingdom versus kingdom, and we're, we'll, have to, we'll have to delineate some of that in a future podcast about the, the you know, difference between kingdom-mindedness versus just kind of church-mindedness and all this stuff, but this, is already, this podcast is already going to be long enough. Again, What we need to combat Jezebel is we need, I'll say, a a spirit of Jehu, okay? Don't get too caught up in those words, though, okay? It is people to rise up, people who are called of God to do so, that will rise up in God's governance and rulership and confront the spirit of Jezebel. Confront does not mean mealy-mouthed, we're all in a room, the ten of us, we all agreed, you know, and, and just kind of... Well, you know, we don't want to offend, and we don't. No, Jehu wasn't worried about offending anybody. Okay, he killed a bunch of people. Okay, no, I'm not in any way saying that the New Testament church operates that way. But we cannot be little wimps that can't call out evil, can't call people to repent, can't look at certain governmental entities or or organizations in our world. I mean, go to their own websites like I did for two hours last podcast. Go to their own websites and, and show. These these people are for things like Marxism slash communism. They're, they're, they're for the destruction of the family. They're, they're totally pro-abortion. Come on, folks. Why can't the church can't look at these things and say they're evil? And yet we wonder why our nation is in the state that it is. Now check this out, Matthew 12, 43 through 45. When an evil spirit comes out of a man, it goes through arid places, seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I'll return to the house that I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits, more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that man is worth worse than the first. That's how it is with this wicked generation. Okay? eliminating without filling with something new could end up making it worse, okay? When God wants to drive out a spiritual force, he needs a spiritual replacement. The infilling of the Holy Spirit, for instance, in someone's life, if demonic activity is cast away from them, okay, the lordship of Christ over their life needs to replace that. When we try to battle, war, destroy, you know, the principality over a small, 
over a small town or over a nation or, or over a continent, okay? It needs to be replaced with God's government, not with, oh, now we just got an organization together with bylaws and stuff, okay? Not against bylaws, not against organizations, but it needs to be a God-called governance that happens. Now, Again, I don't have time to get through all this, right? Apostles and elders, Acts 15, 2, 15, 4, 15, 6, Acts 22, or 15, 22 through 23, Acts 16 and 4. You can go and look at 1 Timothy, right? And Titus, they both deal with elders and, and the governance of the church as well as deacons. Uh, you can you can look at all these things and you see and know apostles and elders were there for the governance of the church. And that's what we need. We need proper church government, all right. It was these were people that were appointed by God, called by God to rule. Now, I'll just take one example, Titus 1 and 5. The reason I left you in Crete was that you might straighten out what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. All right. We have the fivefold ministry. Powerful, awesome. But the fivefold ministry, scripturally, I'd like to see where it says the fivefold ministry it, it always has to be a part of the governance of a church. You don't see that. I don't see that. Where is it at? Show me. Please show me. We, the fivefold ministry is imperative, but they all have their function, right? It, it's not a matter of titles, it's function. People doing pastoring, people doing evangelism, people do. And yes, people can be in that vein as a fivefold called evangelist, right? And what is their purpose? One, to do that calling, but also to train and teach and equip others according to Ephesians chapter 4. And they work as a team, and every local church would do well to have all of the fivefold ministry operating within it. But too much of the church is trying to operate without God-called governance. I don't mean governance in the way of just being an administrator for the church. The church CEO, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about governance in God has given that person a territory that they are over in the spirit. I Again, this is a call thing. If you're, if God has given you the state of Georgia and you go into the state of Virginia and try to use that, but God has not granted you that territory, you're going to get, you're going to get smoked. Okay. Even if God has granted the state of Georgia, uh, I was, I was in, uh, I was talking to somebody today at, at, uh, over lunch and they mentioned about Joshua and how before Joshua went in and conquered all the land of Canaan, God said, I've given you the land. Well, no, you haven't. We, why do we got to go fight? Because I've given it to you, but you got to go. You got to partner with me. There needs to be action that goes with this faith. You need to go forward in faith, understand that I have given it to you, but you got to walk in lockstep with me. You got to obey. You got to follow me. You got to lean on me, but I've given it to you and you got to go take it. Well, praise God. <laughs> Let's go. But if God's given you territory, it's still on us to pray and seek God and take it. But there's a call of God for someone to be over territory and govern that territory for him on his behalf in the spirit. Okay? And that's why we need spiritual authority and governance. Now, people have abused that. But just because people abuse it doesn't mean it's not true, right? We can you we can take a baseball bat and we can play baseball with it, have a great time. You could even defend your family with a baseball bat. But just because somebody grabs a baseball bat and beats somebody up with it and needs to go to jail, okay, that doesn't mean we should abolish baseball bats. We should abolish baseball. We should you know, abolish taking care of our family. That no, we need to uh, we need to correct the incorrect use of it. We need to correct the wrong use of it, but we need to encourage the proper use. And this is what happens to so many people. They get burned by leadership. They get, they get hurt by things. And then they're, oh, it's all bad. It's all wrong. It's not real. It's not for today. Okay. Somebody going off crazy in the spirit. So, you know, quote unquote, in the spirit, you know, given a word of knowledge, it was totally way off and hurting and damaging some family. And then, right. And then somebody goes, oh, that stuff's not for today. I don't believe in any of that stuff. Well, no, you need to, you need to correct the false, but you need to allow for the true. And I'm saying that spiritual governance is, governance is one of the things the church is so lacking today. 
And if we had it, we would see more of the Spirit of God, kind of that open heaven. You know, that's a big term right now, open heaven, prayer altars, right? All this stuff. What we really need, we need spiritual government to happen. And it flows from people that are flowing in a calling of God that God is called to govern. Now, 1 John 3, 8 and 9, He who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. Jesus came to destroy the work of the devil. That's why Jesus came. He came for, you know, we could say many reasons, but the, for the, the, what God was doing was my kingdom in the earth. What Jesus said, thy kingdom come, thy will. The first, the first thing, right? <laughs> we, we, we get so caught up in some of the, some of the other things things that he said, we forget the whole part about, hey, your kingdom. And what did he preach the most? The kingdom. Did he preach salvation? Yes, because salvation means what? We're born again. We're brought into the kingdom. How do you get people in the kingdom? Through that, through that, through through the new birth experience. That's how we get in the kingdom. But the point is not just the new birth experience. The point is the kingdom. And that's the thing. We get caught up healing and miracles, man, they're powerful. But but what are they? They're part of the kingdom. They're, they're not an in, in of themselves. We need to get kingdom thoughts, kingdom-minded. Kingdom versus kingdom, we need governance in the earth. I'm going to do another podcast on the ecclesia, but I'll, I'll just mention it here. The church, the ecclesia, that is supposed to be God's embassy in the earth, bringing heaven to earth. The church is supposed to do that. The church has fallen far short in Western society and Western culture because we've turned church into three songs, basically a, you know, kind of a rock concert-esque with Jesus and a TED Talk, and then hurry up and get him out the door. We've turned it into a business with a CEO who's at the top, okay? We've done all these things to pollute and dilute the church and lost the vision that God originally had for it, and I pray we get it back. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12, Finally, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We've talked about this already through this podcast. Understand it's a spiritual warfare, okay? Spiritual warfare at its core is standing against the enemy. Right over and over and over right here, it says stand, 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 stand. We need people to stand. Okay? Too many of us are not standing. We are not standing. Right? We're not strong in the Lord. Okay? It's in the Lord. We're not strong in our own power, strong in our own intellectualism. The devil, okay, who likes to bring the illumination, the enlightenment. No, I don't think so. He's the devil, and we don't trust him. But he's a lot smarter than any human being, and so we need to rely on the Lord. Our stance and hope is in his mighty power, right? We don't rest in anything else. We don't trust in anything else. This, again, according to Ephesians 6, we put on God's armor so we can stand against Satan, okay? It's interesting that the offensive weapon, the word of God, okay? The word of God is the offensive weapon, the sword, right? We are offensive with the word of God. So if we don't have a word to go and take that territory, we don't try to take that territory. If we don't have a word to deal with this, we don't try to deal with it. We we wait and rely on God. Now, there are some eternally spoken truths in the word of God. We don't have to wait at all. We can immediately open the Bible and boom, there it is. This is a thing that God wants all of us to do. Let's go do it. Okay? But there are some things that we need to take our stand, and then wait and hear from God, how do we need to handle this? What do we need to do here? You see this pattern in Acts all over the place. They came together, they prayed, and then the Spirit spoke, and they said, let's do this. Okay? Not, they came together, they prayed, and then they decided what to do. Okay? Then they voted. That's not how it worked. In, in that passage in 1 John, right? We, we, talk, we already read that. 
right? We see that sin is this critical element here. We got to get sin out of our midst. We're not supposed to be living in sin, okay? Sin invalidates the lordship of Jesus Christ in our personal lives. Of course, he is Lord whether you claim for him to be Lord or not. The question is not, is he Lord of the universe? Is he Lord in complete truth? The question is, are you going to recognize him as Lord now or when you're forced to when it's too late? (laughs) I personally say, let's do it now, right? But much of Satan's attack is not a direct forceful onslaught, right? He's not showing up with, with demons at the door of the church in the spirit while you're having service. You know, we want to destroy you, right? It's a subtle appeal to our flesh because he knows if he can get us to willfully disobey God, if he if he can get us to veer away from, from being the ecclesia, if he can get us from 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 thinking kingdom minded from from fivefold ministry from 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 kingdom governance if he can get us off of this stuff he has won a massive victory so that's why he comes with subtlety the bible lets us know he comes as an angel of light he comes promising bearing gifts right appealing to our flesh money power lust whatever it might comfort right oh just you know, just sink back into your comfort. Be be content. Not biblical contentment, but man-made contentment. Okay, no longer hungry for the move of God, thirsty for God, reliant on God. We're content. We've we've arrived. We're successful. We got a big church. That is exactly where he wants us to get. Okay? Satan will use the stick when necessary right? Or when he really is in full and complete control, then he'll really come out, okay? But in general, he uses the carrot. He uses that lure to get you and me, okay? And I, I've heard, I think I, I think Derek Prince is one of the ones I've heard say this, that, you know, Ephesians 6 goes on to say that, you know, with all prayer and supplication, I've that that's kind of like the long-range ballistic missile, right? Prayer can can go anywhere, places we cannot go physically. Prayer can go there, you know? Prayer is there. And so we need to use that prayer. But those are our offensive weapons. The Word of God, and you got prayer and supplication, right? Those are our offensive weapons. Everything else is defense to help us to stand. So you want to get involved in spiritual warfare? Stop letting the devil tempt you, and you give in. Stop letting the devil... Use your past of sin or maybe hurt, so now you can't move forward in God because you were hurt by this church over here. You were hurt over here, so now you're gonna you're gonna be against all religion, even true religion. You're gonna be against all leadership, even good God called ordained leadership. Right? That's a recipe for disaster. That's what we do, though. That's what we do, though, and we got to stop doing that. We got to stand. We've got to stand. Revelation five. 8 through 10. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which were the prayers of the saints. They sang a new song. You're worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased men for, for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Lots there that we've already said. Kingdom. That's the mentality. But check this out. It's the prayers of the saints that preceded the judgments of God. We find this in Revelation 8 as well, right? Through the book of Revelation, you see that it's the prayers of the saints that gets God moving, gets that action going. And we need to understand this and do this and be a part of this in the earth. We want to defeat Jezebel. We need to stand at the individual level for our families. Maybe you're not called of God to take to take territory. You're one of those prophets in uh, Jezebel's time that you got to hold, you got to stand, right? Elijah said, kill me, there's nobody else. God said, there's 7,000 others. What are you talking about? There's a bunch of them. But where were they? Why weren't they conquering Jezebel? They, they were not called. Guess who was called? Elisha, Jehu. So if you're not called... Don't worry about it. You can still do spiritual warfare. Stand. Stand. Stand against it. Stand in the gap for your family. Stand in the gap for your community. Stand. But we do need those who are called 
to push against and destroy Jezebel. We absolutely do need that. So I think part of your prayer should be, God, identify these people, raise them up, okay? Maybe it's you, but let's be standing while we're doing those prayers. Now, uh, I, I think we'll do a, we'll probably do a podcast in the future, lots of things in the future, <laughs> right? On kingdom, we'll do one on, on kingdom authority as well. We'll do one on calling, right? A, a, a podcast on calling, because it's so vital and so crucial and so important that we act and move and flow in our calling and recognize that there's a calling. You can't just decide, oh, I'm going to be an evangelist and go out and do it. There's a reason why when some people some people go out and do something, it's super effective. It starts a whole movement. And I mean, you tried that whole thing, you know, three years ago and it went nowhere. Okay. Sometimes God does call people to specific things, and he's not calling us. And we, we do well to partner with the calling of God, but we should not think that anything and everything is open to anyone and everyone. It's, it's not. There are certain things that are open to anyone and everyone, right? The believers shall lay their hands on the sick and they shall recover. But it doesn't say you're going to go out and have a powerful healing ministry loosed upon you, Okay. So what are some things we can do? Again, stand firm, right? Be in prayer. Our prayers are powerful, and this is what preceded God moving, and specifically pouring out judgment against the evil spiritual kingdom, right? We we need to do these things. There are more things that we can do, but these are the two that I want to talk about right here. Um, because I've uh, I've been going through them, kind of clearly delineating them, and because this thing can only be so long, I want to <clears throat> make sure that we 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 hold fast to just a couple of things here. Okay, Jesus Christ needs people to align with Him to defeat Jezebel. He wants us to get behind the kingdom government and kingdom authority that he has called to this time, this day, this hour. I pray that God will raise up men of God that have the mantle and the call to govern his kingdom territorially over communities, over counties, states, nations, People that can step into this calling and do it under the anointing and power of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a tall order, but I believe our world needs this. And so I hope that you will join with me and continually pray about this. When we when we when we see what's going on in our nation, right? Just a couple of weekends ago, I think it was. You have a bunch of people out there, Black Lives Matter, burning Bibles now in the street. Well, what does that have to do with Black Lives Matter? Because like I've been saying, this is not left and right, Dems and Republicans. This is good and evil. And at the end of the day, the notions and the belief systems of of this movement, right, at the end of the day, it is about good and evil. It's good and evil. It's, it's not, that's why they're burning Bibles, okay? Because at the end of the day, right, you can't believe the Bible and still stand for the things that are going on right now, right? You, you, you simply can't. And so the Bible is in stark opposition, and they recognize it. And that's why they're burning Bibles, because they actually hate what Jesus stood for, because he stands in the way of their evil agenda, right? They're burning Bibles because, as uh, Henry Edward Manning so eloquently put it, all human conflict is ultimately theological. Jesus Christ is in stark theological opposition to the things that these organizations and these groups and these community activists uh, stand for. 
He is in stark opposition, and so they must burn his word. They must raise their fist in opposition of his word. And I pray that we stand strong, stand with Jesus, pray for his kingdom government, and allow him to raise up. We'll we'll go ahead and say people in the spirit of Jehu, people with kingdom authority and kingdom governance, called of God to stand against the torrent of hell and send the spirit of Jezebel back where it came from and then to replace it with kingdom government that is submitted fully to the lordship and rulership of our Lord Jesus Christ. I love you guys. I hope this series has helped you. Join with me in prayer continually for this. God bless you, and we'll catch you on the next podcast.